Easter 2021. We are unable to convene the usual Easter service in the Arnott Gospel Hall, but we do trust that you'll find this Easter celebration interesting. Easter is to be celebrated. Jesus died and rose from the dead, and so we do trust that you'll take the time to watch this recording. We're here to answer any questions, to provide you with free Bibles and literature, and we would love to hear from you. Thank you. Give me a sight, O oh Saviour, of thy wondrous love to me, of the love that brought thee down to earth to die on Calvary. Oh, make me understand it, help me to take it in, what it meant to thee, the Holy One, to Holy One to bear a 
verses 1 to 8. Early in the morning, the first day of the week, to the sepulchre of the Lord, the place to seek. Sweet spices prepared, the lovingly now bring, odour so sweet, yea, fit for a king. Early in the morning, the first day of the week, what a revelation, they hear an angel speak. The Lord is risen indeed, O oh, words, so sweet, now he ever lives, death is not defeat. Early in the morning, the first day of the week, we should come with spices, Jesus himself to meet. As we draw near to worship, lay them at his feet, bow there in his presence, occupation sweet. Early in the morning, or when evening shadows fall, the Lord will come again for us. We'll hear the trumpet call, caught up in a moment, the twinkling of an eye, whether dead or living, to meet our Lord on high. 1 Corinthians 15 If there be no resurrection, then Christ is not raised. Our preaching is in vain. Our faith is vain. We are false witnesses. Ye are still in your sins. They which are fallen asleep are perished. We are all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead. <laughs> Oh 
a book in the Bible. It's called 1 Corinthians and to the 15th chapter. It's a long chapter, a chapter of 58 verses, all worth reading, all worth pondering. But today from this chapter, I want you to understand three things, three things. Firstly, the truth of the risen Christ. Secondly, the tragedy of a still dead Christ. And then thirdly, the triumphs of the victorious Christ. The truth of the risen Christ, the tragedy of a still dead Christ, and the triumphs of the victorious Christ. The book was written by Paul to Christians in Corinth. He had earlier visited their city. Now Corinth was a, a busy place. Many people came to Corinth for different purposes but Paul had come for the greatest purpose possible what was that you might ask he went to Corinth to preach and what did he preach well this was his message this was his message to them this is my message to you centuries may have come and gone but the terms of the gospel the great message of salvation the message found within the Bible the message of the Bible remains unchanged firstly Christ died for our sins secondly he was buried that would remind us that Christ a, a figure not from mythology but from history a real man this is fact not fiction this is truth not falsehood Christ died and because he was dead he was buried. Nothing really controversial there, nothing really disputable there, nothing really arguable there. Even sceptics, even atheists would concede that Jesus of Nazareth lived and died. But there's a third element, a third strand, a third part to Paul's message and to my message. And it's this, he rose again the third day. You know, before Paul went to Corinth, he had been at Athens. And on Mars Hill, he had preached. Preached about the Lord Jesus. And he had done so without any interruption. His audience had stood or maybe sat and listened but then he referred to Christ's resurrection from the dead and at that point some did interrupt not to voice their approval but rather to express astonishment astonishment and amusement when they heard we are told of the resurrection of the dead some mocked is that your view would you say to me Dead people just don't rise. Well, I concede, I, I have to concede that that is generally true. People live and then people die. They die and they remain dead. They remain in their graves. That is the story of history. But the message of the gospel is this. Christ rose again the third day. What, what evidence would cause you to accept that I wonder would the evidence of eyewitnesses be enough would you be satisfied if individuals 
were to tell you that they actually, with their own eyes, saw the Lord Jesus rise from the dead. Well, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 says that there were eyewitnesses. He says, Christ rose again the third day and he was seen. And in this chapter, Paul makes reference to the fact that the Lord Jesus was seen by three named people and seen by three groups of people. The three people are Cephas and James and Paul. Cephas, that's another name for Simon Peter. The, the, the disciple who was dominant, the leader of the twelve, the leader of the apostolic band. And yet the disciple who was dominant became the disciple who denied. He denied Jesus. Pretended not to be a disciple at all. Professed that he had no links with the Lord Jesus. The last sight Peter had of Christ before the cross, the Lord Jesus was a prisoner in the hands of men. He had been mocked. He had been mistreated. Shortly he would be condemned and then crucified. Peter had no expectation of any resurrection at all. But just a few weeks later, Peter is standing in Jerusalem, preaching to people who were intimately aware of those events in question. And Peter declares, this Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Now, if that declaration were false, it could have been challenged, but it wasn't. Instead, there were those in that congregation that day who were themselves challenged. They were convicted of their sin. They were converted to Christ. They became Christians. And so do you see the value of the testimony of Peter. And then the second individual mentioned by Paul is James. This is most interesting. For James was actually the half-brother of Christ. The parents of James were Mary and Joseph. Or you might say he would be biased then. He would be prejudiced then. How can we accept his word? But you know he wasn't biased at all. The Gospels indicate that during the earthly life of the Lord Jesus, his own family, his own half-brothers and sisters, did not believe in him. Now, they obviously believed in him to the extent that they believed that he was real, he was a real man. But they did not accept that he was the long-promised Messiah of Israel, that he was none other than the very Son of God. That was their stance in the Gospels. But in Acts chapter 1, some disciples gather together to pray and we're told that among them, the, the brothers of Christ, Jesus had appeared to James. And when Jesus appeared to James, on the part of James, his long years of denial, his long years of stubborn, obstinate, determined refusal, they ended. He understands for the very first time who his half-brother really, truly, actually is. And James becomes a Christian. And so do you see the value of the testimony of James. But you know the third testimony is the most powerful testimony of all, Paul himself. Says Paul, last of all he was seen of me also. Paul was previously known as Saul of Tarsus and he would have been well known as a most, perhaps the most bitter opponent of Christianity. The Christians taught that Jesus was the Son of God, but Paul, Saul, did not accept that. The Christians taught that Jesus had risen from the dead, but Paul, Saul, did not accept that. As far as he was concerned, Jesus was a dead imposter, an imposter who was now dead. That was his perception and his purpose in life was to stamp out Christianity. He, he persecuted Christians. He wanted to see them punished. It did not matter who they were, men or even women. 
It did not matter where they were. Distance was no object. He was willing to travel any number of miles inside Israel and elsewhere to arrest them. And then one day, as he was actually travelling to Damascus with authority from the, the Jewish leaders, a light appeared from heaven. A light that dazzled him. A voice that disturbed him. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul asks the question, who art thou, Lord? And the unexpected answer came, I am Jesus. I am Jesus of Nazareth. What an intimation. Not dead, but very much alive. Not an imposter. Not a blasphemer. But indeed, the Son of God, now in heaven. And the persecutor became the preacher. The bitter enemy of the cross became the best evangelist of the cross. And as a Christian, Paul faced suffering. And because he was a Christian, he was put to death. He died for his faith. But right to the end, he maintained the truth that he had preached. Paul wrote to the Corinthians. He wrote other, other letters as well. The last one from Paul found in the Bible is to his friend Timothy. We call it the second epistle of Paul to Timothy. And in chapter 1, he, he says this, Jesus Christ abolished death. Chapter 2, Jesus Christ raised from the dead. In chapter 4, he speaks about the Lord being with him in his life. In the same chapter, he speaks about going to be with the Lord after his death. And so do you see, right to the very end, Paul never abandoned his beliefs. He held them firm because he knew that what he believed was true, he had individually, personally, really actually for himself encountered the risen Christ. And so three individuals all very convincing. And then three groups. The first, the twelve, the third, all the apostles. But let me speak about the second group. Says Paul, seen of above 500 brethren at once. That's some crowd. We're each to give evidence in court. Their testimony would take hours, indeed days, more likely weeks. And says Paul, of whom the greater part remain unto this present. Paul says most of them are still alive. They are around. If you want to contact them, if you want to check with them, if you want to confirm details with them, that can easily be arranged. And all this convinces me, and I trust it convinces you, the truth of the risen Christ. But then coming down the chapter, Paul advances Another argument, not from a positive angle, but from a negative one. What if the Lord Jesus did not rise? And he says this, if Christ be not risen, well, the message preached would be farcical. If Christ be not risen, then faith in that message would be folly. If Christ be not risen, then witnesses who claimed otherwise would be false. If Christ be not risen, then belief in that message would be futile. If Christ be not risen, his followers are not forgiven. They're still in their sins. If Christ be not risen, then dead Christians have perished. If Christ be not risen, then living Christians are to be pitied. Do you understand that whether or not the Lord Jesus rose from the dead is not a minor matter? It's a major one. In fact, it is the, the most major matter of all. Not a trivial thing, rather a crucial thing. Not something superficial, but something significant. You see, if, if Jesus did not rise, then he was a deceiver. He may have claimed to have been good, but he was in fact very bad. He may have said that he was the, the, the saviour, but if he did not rise... He was, in fact, amongst the worst of sinners. If Jesus did not rise, then the Bible is unreliable. 
It declares itself to be the word of God. But if Jesus did not rise, don't you believe that? This book is not true. This book cannot be trusted. If Jesus did not rise, then every copy of the Bible would be as well cast into a fire. And if Jesus did not rise, then I am doomed. If Jesus did not rise, no hope for me. If Jesus did not rise, no heaven for me. Those loved ones I had who were Christians and who have died, died expecting to go to heaven, have in fact gone to hell. And that will be my sad destiny, my awful eternity too. And so do you understand the, the, the drastic, the devastating consequences if Jesus did not rise? The tragedy of a still dead Christ, a, a, a cross but no empty tomb, a death but no resurrection would just be a tragedy. A tragedy for Christ and a tragedy for us all. And so do you see, Paul addresses that issue. But he does so simply from a, a hypothetical viewpoint. If Jesus did not rise, not the, the if of sense, but rather the if of supposition. And then he says this, but now is Christ risen from the dead? If Easter be not true, then all the, the lilies low must lie, the Flanders poppies fade and die, the spring must lose her fairest bloom, for Christ were still within the tomb, if Easter be not true. If Easter be not true, the faith, then faith must mount on broken wing, then hope no more immortal spring, then love must lose her mighty urge, Life prove a, a phantom, death a dirge, if Easter be not true. If Easter be not true, twere foolishness the cross to bear. He died in vain who suffered there. What matter though we laugh or cry, be good or evil, live or die, if Easter be not true. If Easter be not true, but it is true and Christ is risen. And mortal spirit from its prison of sin and death with him may rise, worthwhile the struggle, sure the prize, since Easter, I, is true. The triumphs of the victorious Christ, but now is Christ risen from the dead. And in the remainder of this chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, we have Christ and the pledge that he gives. Christ and the power that he holds and Christ and the promise that he remembers. The pledge that he gives, he is Christ the firstfruits. His rising is the guarantee that one day others will rise. The firstfruits, the first of the harvest that, ga that, that guaranteed that the rest of the harvest would follow. And because Jesus rose from the dead, I have the assurance that those Christians I have laid to rest in their graves will one day rise also. Because of Easter, because of that resurrection day, there will be another resurrection day, Christ the first, Christ the first fruits. And then Christ and the power that he holds. He is Christ the sovereign, Christ the ruler, Christ the king, says Paul, he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. Says Paul, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. You know, the Lord Jesus has already changed the character of death. Death need no longer be feared by the Christian. For the Christian, death has been defeated. Death has simply become the gateway to glory. But the day will come when death itself will be no more. Death is the last enemy and one day it will exercise its might for the very last time and then it will be utterly destroyed. Christ and the power that he holds. And then Christ and the power, the, the, the promise that he remembers. He is Christ the returner, Christ the coming one. 
Before he left this world, he promised to come back for his followers. If I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And this chapter speaks about that day. A day when the, the trumpet will sound. A day when the dead will be raised. A day when the living will be changed. This corruptible, says Paul, he's meaning dead Christians, will put on incorruption. This mortal, says Paul, he's meaning living Christians, they will put on immortality. It's been put like that. That on that coming day, these two groups of Christians will sing a, a, a duet. Dead Christians will now sing, O death, where is thy sting? Living Christians will now sing, O grave, where is thy victory? The triumphs of the victorious Christ. His victory will on that coming day when he comes be our victory as well. And so I hope you've grasped those three points from this little message. The truth of the risen Christ. The tragedy of a still dead Christ. The triumphs of the victorious Christ. Three points in this chapter. And can we go back to those three elements of the message that, that Paul preached to the Corinthians? Do you remember them? Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day. Think about that first statement. Christ died for our sins. How do we know that he, he died? We know he died because he was buried. His burial. A proof that he did indeed die. And how do we know that he died for our sins? How do we know that he he faced the penalty of sin? That he, he fully paid the price of sin? And the answer is because he, he rose again. His rising is a proof that sin has been dealt with. And all that is left for us to do is to believe that message and to trust the Lord Jesus. That's what those Christians in Corinth had done. It had changed their lives and given them the assurance of heaven. And that's what I encourage you to do. Accept this message as true and accept the Lord Jesus as your saviour. Life's first 
Oh! <laughs>